I'm Alicia Krupp from A Cold Shop of Law and welcome to our Chocolate Masters Hangout. Um, today we're going to be talking about dark chocolate, the many sides of the dark side. Uh, so today we are so lucky to welcome uh, Sarah Tibbetts of Velrona Chocolate. Hi Sarah. Hi. Uh, David Chow of David H. Chow Chocolate and Confections. Hey, Hi David. Everyone. Hey Alicia. And Kate Weiser of Kate Weiser Chocolate. Hello. <laughs> For many chocolate lovers, only dark chocolate will do. But dark chocolate has changed a lot in the past 15 years. It isn't just one flavor anymore. Uh, dark chocolate makers are making wonderful dark chocolates from beans all over the world, um, bringing out their really different flavor profiles. So while one may taste fruity, another could taste nutty, still another may have a really nice floral note. And then chocolatiers take these really flavorful chocolate and they use them to make their own creations. So in this Chocolate Masters Hangout, we have our three experts here and we're gonna be talking about all things dark chocolate, um, including some tips and tricks for choosing dark chocolate for your recipes and how to get the best results. So let's get started. We're gonna start with you, Sarah. Um, I thought it would be great to kind of start by going back to basics. And I know there aren't a lot of strict definitions when it comes to different types of chocolate, but can you give everyone just a broad sense of what we mean when we're talking, we say dark chocolate as opposed to a milk or a white? Absolutely. And it's funny because even though it is fairly basic, we're constantly answering this question. So I kind of never get tired of answering it either. The biggest <laughs> difference really is that there's cocoa fiber so it could be called cocoa fiber or cocoa mass. So it's coming from the cocoa bean, but that's the thing that makes dark chocolate different. So all of those chocolates are gonna have the cocoa butter in them, which you'll see in like white chocolate. And then the difference between the white chocolate and the milk chocolate is obviously the addition of milk powder. So all of them are gonna have sugar, all of them are gonna have cocoa butter, but the difference is between that milk powder and having that cocoa mass, that cocoa fiber. So that's really what just what distinguishes the the dark chocolate, right? And so it wasn't that long ago, as I was saying, that people thought of chocolate in these really simplistic terms, you know, dark milk, white. And then along with that kind of simplistic distinction, sort of dark chocolate was thought of as just being a flavor. Um, but we know that Val Valrona, sorry, offers a large range of dark chocolate um, with a lot of different flavor profiles. And I think two of the most popular, you can correct me if that's incorrect, is the uh, Guanaja and the Manjari. Um, so could you just tell us a little bit about each of them, where the beans are sourced from, the flavor profiles, um, are they still just as popular? Are there new flavors that are becoming more popular? It's, it's funny because Guanaja is over 30 years old now. Right. So you can kind of take this back, and we talked about it two years ago on its 30th anniversary and what a big deal it was because that was one of the first chocolates that ever had a percentage on it. And it was a 70% chocolate, which is super high. So everyone was like, okay, this is crazy. It's way too bitter. It's way too intense. People won't like it. And now fast track to where we are over 30 years later, and everybody talks percentage. But really, at the end of the day, what the determining factor in the chocolate is, is the terroir, where it's grown. You know, where those beans, the origin is from, and then past that, how they're handled, how they're fermented, how they're dried, and then how they're roasted, and, and what percentage we end up with. So that's kind of, you know, Guanaja is a great example of that, where we never really sought to say anything about the origin, because it's a very diverse origin, and we keep it very non-specific because we want that chocolate to be, we want it that, I'm sorry, we want that chocolate to be more consistent. So what that means is that in 30 years, it's been the same flavor profile, which mm -hmm. is pretty impressive. Now on the flip side, you have Manjari, which is from Madagascar. So 64% single origin. This is gonna have a totally specific flavor profile. Again, consistent through the years. But if you compare it to another of our 64% chocolate from the Dominican Republic, Tenori, it tastes night and day different. 
You're going to have in the Manjari these really red fruit notes, very acidic, very, very, very specific. So, you know, it's it's interesting now that we do have all these choices. And especially with the brand like Valrona, there's endless choices. I, I would say that those are still two, the mo two of the most best known, well known, and widely used of our chocolates. But I mean, there are a ton of chocolates now. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, from origins to percentages to it's kind of never ending. Right. And I know, I think people sort of think of Guanaja as being sort of a, the workhorse chocolate, right? When you're really looking for that consistency, which I know is a, an issue when you're trying to create the same product over and over and over again, because that's what people are looking for. It's a fancy workhorse. Right. <laughs> Definitely a fancy workhorse. Yes. <laughs> a Clydesdale, if you will. Yes. Um, so then um, a critical part of many chocolate bonbon recipes is the perfect dark chocolate ganache. So could you just explain to the audience what a ganache is, how chocolatiers use it, and which is your favorite Valrona dark chocolate to use in ganache? So ganache in its simplest form is essentially cocoa butter and water. So when you tell people this, they're like, water? You know, you can't make a ganache with water. You absolutely can. David was actually in one of my classes a couple months ago, weeks ago, and we did that very thing where we made a water ganache. So when you're, when you're talking about any form of ganache, obviously the cocoa butter is going to translate to chocolate. It could be white milk or dark. And then that water is going to be milk, cream, water itself, fruit puree, anything in its liquid form. Mm -hmm. So a ganache is just a combination of those two. And then there is some, usually you'll add some form of a, either a stabilizer or something to kind of help with the elasticity or the shelf life, like um, an invert sugar or glucose, liquid glucose. So it really depends on your application and how you're going to use it. Obviously a chef in a restaurant is going to make a little bit of a different ratio of ganache than a chocolatier. And even from there, whether the chocolatier is going to mold it or whether they're going to do a slab ganache that they're going to enroll. So it's kind of one simple basic concept with multiple variables. Perfect. Okay, so let's move from the kind of the inside, or yes, from the inside to the outside, and we're going to bring David into the conversation here. So David, usually when chocolatiers are going to use a dark chocolate for molding or enrobing of bonbons, they'll use a type of chocolate called a couverture. So could you explain what that means and how it's different from other types of chocolate? Sure. There's you know, many, many types of chocolate. And, you know, if you look at the word couverture, it means to cover, to coating. So couverture is a chocolate that has been, you know, mill has been uh, ground to a finer texture. And the most important thing, it is a higher quantity of cocoa butter. So like Sarah said earlier, you, know, you look at the percentages, you know, 70 to 65. And when you look at those percentages, you break it down, there's a percentage of cocoa mass, there's a percentage of cocoa butter, so in a couverture, there's slightly more cocoa mass. I think standards in the US, I think it's 35. And cocoa butter minimum is, I think, 31. Up to, say, I think Guanaja is lower 30s, whereas you look at an equatorial uh, for hand dipping, it's more like a 37, almost 38% uh, at that point. Because when you're doing both an enrobed or a dipped bonbon, you want to look for a thin shell. Because <clears throat> when you're having a truffle, when you're having a bonbon, <clears throat> it's the ganache you should be tasting. It's not the shell of the chocolate. The shell is just to help contain the interior. So obviously with the higher cocoa butter percentage, uh, cocoa butter, that's where you get your beta-5 crystals. That's, you know, when you're tempering chocolate. So that yields, uh, for me, a better snap in the chocolate. It yields a better shine, so like a better final product in all. Right. So what would happen if you were making a molded or enrobed chocolate and you didn't use a couverture? What would happen to your product? It would turn out fine. Again, like say you get any chocolate in bulk, uh, usually look on the side of the bag, it'll have a fluidity kind of meter. So that mm -hmm. will tell you, you know, if a chocolate, you know, usually it's one drop or thicker, up to three or five drops, depending on the brand, uh, if it's thinner. Obviously, if you don't use a couverture, again, there's a lower cocoa butter percentage which means the chocolate is more viscous, so less fluid, so it results in a thicker shell. And a thicker shell, for instance, in a molded chocolate means there's less 
ganache or less filling on the inside, which is the whole purpose of the bonbon in the first place. You want to taste the filling on the inside, not the shell on the outside. Great. Do you have a go-to Valrona dark chocolate that you tend to use in your ganache, or do you always change it up? I always, at the moment, it's Guanaja all the way. Yeah. It's like you said, it's like the workhorse, it's the Clydesdale. <laughs> it's, like Sarah said earlier, it's super consistent in its flavor. It's super consistent in how it performs. It tempers beautifully, has a beautiful fluidity. So it hits, for me, all the marks of what <clears throat> I would need for uh, an, uh, sorry, a molded bonbon. Whereas, for yeah. instance, a dip bonbon, I'd go for maybe an equatorial because it has a higher fluidity. So as you're hand dipping, it's a thinner shell. So, and for instance, equatorial is great for hand dipping, but for instance, I wouldn't use it for say a molded bonbon because because it's so fluid, not much of the chocolate would cling to the mold. A lot of it would drip off the mold. So you would create a shell that might be a bit too thin and might be a bit too fragile when you take it out or during transport. So you gotta mix and match and see what works best for you depending on the application. Right. It's always one of the conversations I find so fascinating because I think people just have no clue. They just pop it in their mouth and they have no concept of how much work goes into making that yeah. little perfect tiny, tiny bite. It's amazing. Yeah, um, the, the smallest choices as, you know, the fluidity affects the final mouthfeel, both in the right. shell and in the ganache. Right, for sure. And I think some people actually like a thicker shell because they feel like they're getting more chocolate. And, you know, it's like, no, it's <laughs> <laughs> that's only part of what you're what you're trying to experience. <laughs> um, what are some of the filling flavor pairings that tend to go better with a dark chocolate as opposed to a milk or a white? So for me, I like more like the darker, roasted, warmer kind of flavors. So obviously, you have the always the standard, you know, the strawberry, the raspberry, the passion fruits, um, the coffees, the caramels. But I love my favorite is like warm spices with dark chocolate so like a painted piece or a cinnamon or a fennel so that those kind of warming spices I think helps not mute out but blends very well and complements that kind of more bitter I don't want to say tannic but more bitter flavors in the chocolate that warmth and bitter that they play off each other but I mean at the end of the day right flavor is flavor it's subjective everyone will always love certain things with certain chocolates for instance everyone says raspberry is perfect with dark chocolate but I recently did a ganache with raspberry and milk chocolate because it was a revelation because I always I was always taught and always you know raspberry dark chocolate raspberry dark chocolate it was drilled into me but I had it it was a brilliant combo because obviously the acidity and the fruitiness in the raspberry played off the sweetness and the more creamy nature of milk chocolate just as well so I mean like at the end of the day experiment if it doesn't work with one try another chocolate yeah there's you have endless choices that's the great endless, thing absolutely and I mean that's Part of the fun of being a chocolatier is discovering new flavor combos. You know, if you do something, it's horrible, then you just know next time not to do it again. So as simple as that. Right. That's very true. Okay, Kate, now let's hear from you. Do you right. have a go-to Valrona Dark that you tend to use for your ganache recipes, or do you always change it up? And what about enrolling and shell molding? Yeah, so my absolute, absolute favorite dark chocolate right now, and I say right now because my, my taste buds change, and as, as I'm tasting all new chocolates, you know, it kind of changes it up, but right now I'm absolutely obsessed with Elanka. It is, it like speaks to my soul, and we, I mean, I'll eat it, you know, in chip form with a banana, or I'll put it in a ganache, you know, like it. We use it for almost everything now, and it's funny because I was actually surprised at how well it worked with all of these different flavor combinations. You know, we'll put it with a coffee, and it was like incredible. And then you think, well, then it can't be good with all these other things. And we kept just kind of experimenting, and turns out it is delicious with citrus flavors. It is delicious with berry flavors. Um, so it, it was really surprising to me that it worked in so many different ways. Um, and it definitely simplified things for me from a business perspective because we now just have to order basically one type of dark chocolate. We have to maintain that inventory. So, you know, every decision that we make here is, is all about the flavor and the texture of the mm -hmm. final result. But if you can also have your decisions be easy on your business. That's just a plus all around. So I love Elanka. I think it's fantastic. 
Um, I will say my customers, I don't think, noticed when we changed our ganache recipes from, say, a manjari or, you know, other dark chocolates we're using to a lanka. We thought, oh, no, our customers are going to freak out. But I, I don't think they really had the, you know, the developed palette to really notice the difference. So on my end, I got to make my chocolates way better, in my opinion, and it also didn't affect customers in a negative way. So that's why we switched almost all of our dark chocolate ganaches to Elanka. Right, right. Um, but as far as you know, changing it up again, for me, it's always a business decision. We, you know, we get really, now that we're in our third year of business, we're mass producing these bonbons on a really large scale. I mean, they're still done by hand, but anything that we change has all these ripple effects. You know, mm -hmm. most, mostly it's in the marketing and it's in the materials that we already purchased, you know, the, the ingredient labels on all the packaging and all that good stuff. So, you know, we just changed three flavors in our case um, for the first time in two years because it was that challenging to get the timing right so that we wouldn't waste all this money. Um, so, you know, changing things up is super fun for me. It, it keeps the creativity alive. I think it's important for my team to be able right. to, to experiment with um, new chocolates and new flavors and all that stuff. Um, but we just have to be really smart about it now, which is a good problem to have. So, you know, we're, you know, I'm not complaining by any means. But um, as far as enrobing and shell molding, we don't do any enrobed here at KYS with chocolate, we are basically all mold, uh, use molds. And we actually use a, kind of a sister company to Valrona for our shells. We use Republic of Cacao, an Ecuadorian chocolate. It's delicious. It, it, it's just a great, like a great workhorse. Kind of what we we're saying, you know, you don't want people to taste crazy flavor notes in your shell because, again, you're just trying to create a thin, sort of mm -hmm. capsule to deliver your beautiful ganache. So you don't right. want to like go crazy with flavors on your shell. You just want to keep it very sort of kind of neutral. Um, and we think that the, the bulk Ecuador is perfect for that. And the fluidity again, like David mentioned, so important um, when deciding which chocolate to use for your shell. So I remember we used to use um, a different type of chocolate that was too fluid and we had a lot of issue with the shell cracking, not being able to be transported. So, you know, you have to think of all these different things when, when selecting what type of chocolates you're going to use. Right. And what are some of your favorite flavors to pair with dark chocolate? Um, I personally, the ones that I eat every day are the ones with citrus. So mm. I love acidity, manjari. I used to eat that all the time because it was so kind of citrusy and fruity. Um, so I love fruit and chocolate. I love yuzu and dark chocolate. That's like my ultimate favorite. Yeah, David. <laughs> <laughs> yuzu and dark chocolate is like the perfect yeah. combination. It's unique. It's different. It, it's refreshing. You can have it at any time of the year. It's delicious. I love it. That's my favorite. Maybe for people who don't know, like how would you what how would you describe the difference between yuzu and just an orange? <sighs> I think David could probably describe no, yuzu better. Go for it. It's go just for it. Kind of like a well, isn't it a mix of like a mandarin orange and a lemon? So it's like it's a lemon, but it's a more muted acidity. But the acidity is incredibly floral. It's hard to describe the fragrance. Floral, I think, is the closest word. Like this explosion. Yeah. It's yeah. something you recognize, but with like floral twist on it. Right. And I, I tell my customers, once you have something yuzu, you will always be able to recognize that flavor going it's forward. Whether, whether it's in like a dish that you're eating, a savory dish, you'll always be able to like pinpoint it because it's so unique. Right. Yeah. So everyone needs to run out and get some yuzu <laughs> something and taste it so that they know what we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so now we have I have questions that are kind of for all three of you. And I know, so Sarah, we talked a bit about making um, ganache with dark chocolate at the beginning, but do Kate or David, do you guys have any other tips or tricks for making ganache that you want to share? David, why don't you go first? For me, it's just, it's like with tempering chocolate. A lot of it has to do with temperature. So obviously cocoa butter has a melting point. 
around 35, 38 degrees. Obviously, you have to maintain, make sure, you know, when you melt your chocolate or your ganache or when you're incorporating cream, temperature, temperature, temperature. So make sure your cream and your chocolate is above 35 degrees. That's the fusion point of cocoa butter, so it gets to create that emulsion. If it goes too below that, you know, heat up the chocolate, heat up the cream slightly more just to even out the two. And also, for me, uh, don't be afraid of ganaches separating. It's not the end of the world, you know, I've taught classes, you know, taught students, taught staff, you know, when you're making ganache, you know, it'll inevitably break. It's not the end of the world. Just keep stirring, keep stirring again, watch the temperature, and eventually everything will come back into that emulsion together. Right. Kate? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't know, you know, the people viewing from home, if they have heard of making a ganache using the emulsion method, um, it's definitely not something I learned from culinary school. You know, when I was in culinary school back in 2004, it was pour hot cream over dark chocolate <laughs> chips and stir. Uh, and, you know, you can make a ganache this way. It's definitely doable. But once you have the silky, smooth texture ganache from doing it the emulsion method, where you're basically making a mayonnaise uh, with chocolate and cream and they're both the same temperatures and you combine them perfectly, you will never go back to making it the old way. And and probably Sarah, you could chime in here with how to actually do the emulsion method. Can you see how excited <laughs> I am here? I'm like, I love the emulsion. <laughs> <laughs> I, I get paid to talk about the emulsion. <laughs> So, I mean, that's that's exactly. I mean, I didn't really elaborate on it too much because I knew we'd come back and talk about it. Right. Um, but essentially, I mean, that's really the, it's the backbone and the key to all the Rona ganaches. So we use this method in everything from a basic ganache and whether that ganache turns into a mousse or a creme you or any time that you have basically that water and that cocoa butter. So cream and chocolate, milk and chocolate. So to elaborate a little bit more on what David and Kate were saying, it's really about stabilizing the water and the cocoa butter crystals. So through this process of, I love, we always talk about the chocolate mayonnaise. So thank you, Kate. <laughs> um, <laughs> through this process, you're essentially slowly adding hot liquid to melted chocolate. And as David mentioned, it will break. It will look terrible. I do this in classes and people are like, like gasping. They're like, oh, what, what have you done? And it's just a really magical process because it goes from something really horribly ugly that looks like a disaster to just this beautiful, silky smooth ganache. And what you're doing through this process is stabilizing that water in the cocoa butter. <clears throat> and you get these end results that help you with your shelf life, help you with the finished texture. You don't have cracking, you don't have the weeping that you would in some of your finished products. So it's really an amazing, very simple technique that totally changes your ganache. And yeah, what we were what we were taught back in the day, I mean, it just doesn't really apply anymore. So um, one also add on, I forgot to mention my favorite chocolate to make ganache. Oh, um, I am much like Kate, where I kind of change with like basically every month or every year, I'm like, this is my new favorite chocolate. But I love chocolate from the Dominican Republic. Mm -hmm. I found that it's very uh, warm, very a lot of roasted notes to it. I also like chocolates that are a little bit more flexible, a little bit more versatile. Um, I do love Alonka, Kate, excellent choice. And Guanaja, how can you not go wrong? But Oreato is my new go-to, which is a 60%, it's actually a double origin from uh, Peru and the Dominican Republic. And for a 60%, it's not as sweet as you would think. And for me, I'm just like, this is, this just makes me happy. Like I eat it and I feel like I'm drinking hot chocolate. I feel like I wanna sit in front of a fireplace and I'm warm and cozy. And it's just, it really is a great chocolate, whether you use it for a ganache, in any application, I chop it up, I put it into chocolate chip cookies. And so that's my, that's my go-to this year. Check back with me next year. <laughs> <laughs> we will. <laughs> that sounds fantastic. And so now we're going to talk just a little bit about some tips and tricks for using dark chocolate as a when you're shelling for a molded chocolate. So David, why don't you go first? 
shelling for molded chocolates. Uh, for me, temperature. Uh, for me, everything comes down to temperature. Both, both. Again, you have to think temperature of the chocolate, and of course, you also have to think of the temperature of the mold and the temperature of the kitchen. So all those come into effect. You know, if your temperature of your kitchen is too cold, you might have to warm your temperature slightly above the recommended. Well, in Canada, in Celsius is 32, and Fahrenheit, I don't remember what it is. Um, <laughs> no, but maybe you'll have to heat your chocolate slightly warmer. Or if your kitchen's too cold and your mold's too warm, maybe hit it with the heat gun just slightly to warm up the mold. So temperature always plays a key, because again, you're looking for that thin, thin, thin shell. And for me, I don't have a machine, so I still hand uh, mold everything. And I know a lot, of, a lot of people use the spoon in the... Uh, temperature holding tank kind of method, but I like the piping bag method. So it imitates, I guess, kind of a depositor from a machine. For me, it's like, it's cleaner, it's less waste, and I can control, you know, the piping bag, so make sure it gets into the, all the nooks and crannies uh, of the mold. And mm -hmm. uh, what else? Polishing molds, I know we'll talk about that later. And I'll, obviously, the shape of the mold is also, one of, one of my big pet thieves is a mold with like weird 90 degree or hard, strange angles. I like molds with like, round shapes because it's both, it's both easier to polish and easier for chocolate to get into the mold. Right. It could be harder to get the air bubbles out when you have the yes, corners. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I'm sure Kate, can, Kate has a million molds, so she probably <laughs> has a ton to add. <laughs> Kate, go for it. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I definitely have a million molds. It's, it's ridiculous. But no, to, to David's point about temperature, you know, I, I'll get a lot of, um, some of my team members they'll be kind of new to chocolate and something that i always try to tell them is the rules that you know the rules that you you know the set temperatures that you have to hit as you work with chocolate throughout the day you're gonna have to kind of feel the chocolate and what it wants to do so like you may have to adjust the temperature as you know if you're using a wheel machine and you start getting over crystallization you kind of have to like work with the chocolate you, you can't really just say it needs to be at 31.2 degrees celsius and when it's not there it's done you know you have to kind of it's almost like a human being with like really ridiculous feelings like you have to like understand how the chocolate is feeling and adjust your technique based on that so if we're working with the chocolate right away right after a temper you know, we might leave it on the vibrating table for two seconds because we know it's more fluid, so it'll it'll get into those nooks and crannies faster. And then we may kind of tap it out for less time because we don't want a shell that's too thin. But if we're working with the chocolate four hours later after we initiated the temper, then we have to change our method. So you really have to just like understand your chocolate, understand its feelings, and kind of adjust your technique accordingly. So it's never really a one rule thing. It's always kind of like like a relationship that you have to maintain <laughs> throughout the day. <laughs> it's complicated. It is. It's, it's, it's complicated. That's, yeah. You heard it here first, everyone. Chocolate has feeling. <laughs> <laughs> Don't offend your chocolate. <laughs> That's great. Definitely not. Um, Sarah, what do you have to add about uh, molding? I mean, that's, those are great bits of information and Kate hit the nail on the head. I mean, you have to adapt to your environment. And since I essentially travel a lot and I'm working in a lot of different kitchens with a lot of different chefs, we don't take our Bon Bon traveling road show. We don't do that because it's just, it's, it's too hard to know that environment which is why we, we tend to keep all of the bonbon classes and everything that we do out of our school in New York where we essentially have a perfect environment. Right. Because, I mean, it's, it's hard enough to, to temper chocolate and to work with chocolate, let alone having all the other challenges surrounding it environmentally. So at the school, we're very lucky because we have the enrobing machine, we have the tempering machine. Um, I prefer the method with the piping bag because I do think that it's it's very clean, but also we're talking about working at a school. So we're gonna do things, you know, I, I try to be realistic about the techniques. You know, and the first thing when I whip out a piping bag is people are like, well, you know, that's gonna add up, that's gonna be expensive. You know, I'm like, oh, you're absolutely right. So we'll do the other technique where we use a ladle. So we'll show you both ways. Mm -hmm. But it all goes back to, you know, what David said too, you can't have these fine little edges 
and use, you know, a ladle, you're going to have air bubbles. So there's multiple factors. And really, you know, at the end of the day, for me, it's adapting to your environment, but also being realistic with your environment. I, I mean, it's amazing that, Kate, you work in literally the hottest and hottest <laughs> state, and that David, your kitchen, we were talking earlier, is very warm. I mean, sometimes people will tell me, they're like, well, my kitchen, you know, it's about 90 degrees Fahrenheit, and it's just, I'm like, then maybe you should reevaluate what you do. <laughs> maybe you shouldn't be tempering chocolate. You know, like, it's, and it's just, it's not, you just have to be realistic sometimes. Yeah. I've seen makeshift chocolate rooms in New York kitchens where it's like a tarp and plastic bags over an air conditioning unit. And I mean, if you really want it, you can make it happen. But you also, you know, if you're not comfortable, if you can, if you can make the chocolate, but you have nowhere to store it, then, you know, you, you have to be realistic. So for me, it's that adapting and also being realistic. Right. That totally makes sense. So this is something that I think chocolatiers like to talk about because it's like a get to know you question. Sort of, which is how do you clean your molds? <laughs> do you clean them? That's a personal question. That is a I very know, I, really <laughs> I learned that early on. <laughs> so, uh, Sarah, why don't why don't you go first this time? Well, you know, it's funny because that goes back to being at a school. You know, we're yeah. teaching these classes, and then we're we're not doing production. We're not in production mode. So yeah. we're constantly cleaning the wools because you can't have a class that comes back in a couple weeks or a couple months and we're giving them dirty molds from the last class. Like it's not professional. It's just not really, you know, what we would do. So we're always cleaning them, usually with just hot water, no soap by hand. Now past that, if I was, which I have, you know, been working before in larger production and volume, you just polish them. You keep them fairly clean. As long as you work clean enough, I mean, you don't necessarily have to clean them every time. So. Right. Okay. Kate. Oh my gosh. How much time do we have? So I can literally talk. <laughs> you can talk about for cleaning like as long as you want. <laughs> so this, I think this is my absolute favorite question to ask other chocolatiers because it is a very get to know you question and I find that every chocolatier has a different way of doing it and it's just fascinating to hear these other methods. Um, I have tried probably 10 different methods of cleaning the molds. Do we clean them? Do we not clean them? Do we use soap? Do we not use soap? Do we use alcohol? Do we not use alcohol? Do we use pads? Do we use cheesecloth? I mean there's literally a million different ways you can do it. Um, I recently went to a class in Las Vegas uh, taught by Melissa Capel, and that was my biggest question is how do you wash your molds? And she actually uses her three compartment sink and she washes, rinses, and sanitizes the mold, which, you know, soap, obviously you can get some anti-grease soap that will affect color but when she showed me her method, it worked so well. The shine was so beautiful. So I came back home to Dallas and I said, we're changing it up. <laughs> because the idea of having perfectly cleaned and sanitized molds, especially when you're doing mass production, um, that was really, really important to me because I was always worried, you know, we're not sanitizing these. Like it just feels wrong, you know, not to sanitize them. So, we started to do that method, and then the way we, we do it is we'll have a guy come in, and that's all he does. So whatever we banged out from the week before, he will put all those through the three-compartment sink, and then we'll let those air dry overnight. And then we've got another two people where um, the week before, I will tell them what we're making, what we're producing the next week, so they always know which molds need to be polished. So it's kind of this beautiful flowing uh, production that we try to keep on top of. But what they do is they then take those clean molds, they'll spritz it with a little bit of um, like 91% alcohol, 91 proof alcohol, and then uh, they'll go into each cavity with one of those little makeup uh, cotton little pads. So I've got three people whose whole job is to wash and polish our molds, and it is meticulous work and I love them so much for doing it because we've all done it ourselves 
we know the pain in the finger. If your finger doesn't hurt, you're not doing it right. <laughs> so we try to keep them very happy because they make our life much, much better. Right. Okay, so David, it's your turn. Cleaning molds. Cleaning molds, yeah, very personal question. So I used to <laughs> subscribe to the not cleaning the mold method for the longest time, unless it got like super dirty. Because obviously yeah. people used to say, you know, it's like a cast iron pan. It's like when you use it first, it comes out perfectly, then it's kind of seasoned, quote unquote, and you just keep using and using it. But like Kate said, it, at some point, like it gets so dirty, you can't, you're like, this can't be right. So now I've changed it completely. So like her, it's cleaned, washed, sanitized after every time. It is air dried overnight again, and then polished with uh, flat cotton, like makeup cotton pads, like something non-abrasive. And then obviously Q-tips if it gets really bad. And then I usually polish twice with the cotton. And then if I'm really going for a shine, then alcohol as well. So. Right. And for the polishing pads, just because this has been a recent story <laughs> with my company, so we used to like go around in Dallas to all the Walgreens and, and just figure them out of the makeup polishing pads, yeah. like makeup little things. Because I use the same thing David uses. And literally, they would recognize us coming in with our chef coats and be like, okay, here's, you know, 20 bags. Yeah. But I, I recently found somewhere I could get them online and we could get them in in bulk. So that was a big check off the to-do list was to buy those in bulk. Yeah. So you go through a lot. Yeah. I bet. Well, th we've had a great conversation today, everybody. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you so much. Um, so thank you to Sarah Tibbetts of Velrona Chocolate and David Chow of David H. Chow Chocolates and Confections and Kate Weiser of Kate Weiser Chocolate for taking time out of your busy day to join our conversation and help everyone learn more about dark chocolate. Um, if you know anyone that missed our live broadcast, don't worry, we'll be posting the video on our website www.acolechocolat.com shortly. And thank you for watching everybody. Bye. Thank Bye. You. Thank Bye. You.